Meeple Nation Podcast, episode 369, Folklore, The Affliction. Welcome, citizens of Meeple Nation. For the next 30 minutes, sit back and enjoy. Meeple Nation Podcast is sponsored by GameToppersLLC.com. Game Toppers, you've heard us talking over the last couple episodes about the Kickstarter that they have. Well, we're now just over a week into the Kickstarter. Like we have told you, this new stuff from Game Toppers is amazing. Their original stuff is amazing, and this just adds amazing to amazing. Or maybe it's amazing squared. Either way, go check out the Kickstarter, GameToppersLLC.com. Look at all the awesome, awesome stuff that they have to improve your game nights by improving your game service. We talked about the Watson, we talked about the Mycroft, and how enjoyable it is to play on those with the Kickstarter. You can set those up anywhere, even without a table. And if you're just dying to see a table, you can set up new things on top of the topper to turn it into a table, like a dining room table or whatever. You can go ahead and leave your game set up. You can set the new dining covers over top of games that you want to leave set up. If you want to hide it because you're like, oh no, the wife just came home and she's found that I'm still playing games. We'll set up the dining cover to cover your tracks. Are you normally <laughs> panicked when your wife comes in? <laughs> Check them out. GameToppersLLC.com. And don't forget the Kickstarter. We are your hosts of Meeple Nation. I am Logan Howard. I am Andy Holiday. I'm Nathan Howard. And I'm Dave Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> that sponsorship was rough, Dave. <laughs> so this week we are discussing the game Folklore the Affliction. What a great game. Is, Spoiler alert. It is awesome. This actually was the very first game I kickstarted. Not the first game kickstarter I've received, but it's the first one I actually kickstarted. It is a campaign game. No surprise there. No surprises at all there, right? But it's very unique. It's unlike any campaign game I've ever played. There's actually a lot of different modes that you kind of play in in this game. So you have basically a storybook, an encounter book, a story journal. You're going to start with story number one. You start out on the world map. In the case of story one, you're going to start out at the Church of the Crossroads. You're going to follow this story along and make decisions. And the decisions you make can affect the game, kind of like a legacy game, but it's not a legacy game. It's just a campaign game. There's three different cities you can visit on the world map. As you're traversing the world map, you can choose to go on the road. And you'll have different road events that maybe are a little safer, not quite as scary. But you also have off-road events that you go on, which are going to typically be a little bit more dangerous. There's a leader that you're going to switch. Every player will be the leader, and it'll switch as you're on the world map. Every round, after someone moves, you're switching the leader, and it will switch from day to night. So your events will also switch day and night. So night events tend to be a little bit more dangerous than day events do. So it's really cool, as your group is traveling, you can set it up for five players, up to five players. Each person is going to have a character. As Andy was just talking about, you have this little uh, token that shows who the leader is during that turn. You can move up to your speed when it's your turn. When you're the leader, the party moves at your speed. So you can travel up to your speed. Because um, it's one party marker for the entire team, right? On the world map, yes. Right, on the world yeah. map, yeah. It's really simple. It has this token. It's like a moon. You pass this token and flip it from side to side just to indicate day or night. Andy's turn. It's daytime when we leave town. At the end of his movement, we're on the road. Then we pull out a daytime road event. And then... It's going to be Nate's turn next. And so he passes that leader token to Nate. He flips it over to the night side. And then he decides where we're traveling on his turn. And then at the end of his travel, we pull out that the night event in this case. Whether it's on the road or off-road, like you were just saying. Leader token passes to the next player, and it's day again, and so on. So it's really simple to keep track of. It sounds kind of confusing, but it's really simple to keep track of. Really cool mechanic. The interesting thing is because you're switching leaders every round on the world map, when you're playing on the world map, you're basically traveling as part of the storyline. Moving to one location that's going to further the storyline, and maybe you'll have an encounter there or whatever you're going to do. Say, for example, you're, the party's traveling to Wayland Point, which is a city on the map. As a group, you can discuss how you want to travel by road or off-road, but ultimately it's the leader that, that decides. So say one person really wants to go off-road, maybe get there a little bit faster, do the shortcut than taking the long way around person that's a leader decides to take the road and then the next player goes and they can say, nope, we're going off road. It's interesting. Yes, you're discussing it with the party, but ultimately on the world map, the leader has the final say on where you move. 
theoretically, you could advance five spaces toward where the party is really wanting to go. And then somebody was like, I really think like we should do this. And they could just backtrack the other way. And they just... totally could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which there are side quests there. They're called rumors. And there is a little bit of that, but I think mostly whenever we've played, we've been able to discuss, okay, should we as a group go this way? Yeah. And so it's only minor disagreements. And I think that's mostly what you'll come up with. Not necessarily one player taking it to one side of the map and the other player taking it back and forth. You have a common destination that yeah. everybody as a group is trying to get to. You're trying to progress the story to get to this point. How you get there if you take the off-road. I remember I took the off-road one and I regretted it. We ended up fighting some werewolves. It's a random encounter. Each story will have a, a skirmish table. If you encounter something when you're in the world map, typically it's going to be a skirmish, a quick battle. You're not pulling miniatures out or anything like that. You're just looking at your character card, the monster character card, and it's double-sided, so there's a skirmish side and an encounter side. You're going to roll a die and set their health meter at whatever you roll, depending on the number of players. Depending on where their health meter sits, they're going to have bonuses or penalties. Further down their health gets, the easier they're going to be to defeat. They'll have a health value and what they do when they attack, how much damage they do. Whereas the players in a skirmish get to decide whether they're going to attack or defend. Everybody has a token and you're going to flip that token simultaneously. I'm going to attack, which means go off of your base might, which you add to your die roll. It's a percentile dice, D100. And you're going to add your might to the die roll and you're going to try to get equal to or greater than what the monster's defense is. And that will just reduce their health track by one. Or if you choose to defend, you're going to get a negative to your might, but you'll get a bump to your defense. So you're going to be a little harder to hit. And I have noticed typically, starting out, your defense is pretty low. Usually in the 30s, you're most likely to get hit in skirmishes and in encounters. So the skirmishes, there's always a reward at the end. Typically it's gold. You don't get experience, which is called more in this game. Typically you don't get lore for skirmishes. You get those more on the larger battles where you're actually going to pull out minis and have a more like a dungeon crawler experience. I like that they have the two different types of battles. To me, it keeps the story moving. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not like Session of Gloomhaven where the entire map is what we're setting up. Basically what would be an encounter. But skirmishes, it's just like a little thing that gets us from we ran into something, we did it, we move on, we go to the next one. Although some of them have kicked our butts pretty good. Yeah, obviously some monsters are going to be more difficult than others, but it is a good way to get gold as you're traveling from one city to the next. When you go to cities, depending on the size of the city, so there's three cities, three different sizes, and the size of the city will dictate how many services you can actually get in that city. And there's a list of services that are available at the cities, and I love this part of it. Each character has their own unique things they can do at cities. So for example, at the Alchemist, if you're the gentleman, if you go to the Alchemist, you can buy a magnifying lens. Nobody else in the game can buy the magnifying lens except for the alchemist. Then the only way you can do that is by going to the alchemist in any one of the cities. Every character has a list of different locations in the city they can go to that has a unique thing that they can do at that location. I thought that was a great touch. I do too. There's a ton of variation in, in what those unique things are. For example, I'm playing the telepath. One of her special things, because there's several. She can get a special item at the Tinker. She can get a special item in the market. She can get a special item in a couple of places. The one that I've loved so far is at the Gypsy Encampment. I can go there, roll a d6, I believe. It could have been a d10, though. That's typically the two different things that you roll on these random outcomes. There's different things that could happen. The thing that I've been happy with so far is that both times I've done that, I've come away being ethereal. It makes it so that I can absorb two hits every time I get wounded. The first two wounds don't affect me. I'm able to survive a lot better. And I just think, again, just how unique that is. Totally different from a magnifying glass or whatever else. There's a ton that they went into and did with this. Which they have so many characters. It took Dave almost a week to pick a character to play, just because the amount of choices were amazing. I'm glad when I came in, that choice was already taken <laughs> care of. <laughs> it, it actually didn't take me long at all this time. Well, and the base game only has six characters, but with the expansions, it expands the characters substantially. Definitely worth getting the expansions just for the characters and all the extra content that you get with those. One other interesting thing, as you mentioned taking damage, Dave, if by chance you happen to die in yes. the encounter or during one of the skirmishes, that doesn't mean you have to get a new character. There's actually a ghost miniature for every single character, and you become a ghost. You flip your card, you have ghost abilities that are unique you can go back to town and you can get your character back, be resurrected. But you're not out of the battle or the skirmish or whatever you're in. You still get to participate as a ghost. 
I love that aspect of it. Even if you do die, even in the encounter you're in, you're still in the game. That just reminded me of something we haven't talked about yet. When you begin the game and you're selecting your character, you select the character card. The card has two different paths that you can follow. For the telepath, there's two different paths. One of those makes it so that I basically would have helped everybody when they're in their ghost form. I get a bunch of bonuses to that. The thing that I chose, though, was one where I have a bunch of extra telekinetic powers. Just, again, more that you can do. And none of us have died so far, but because they've put so much into it for ghost characters, I'm kind of looking forward to when it does happen because I think it'll be kind of cool. It's definitely not saying, oh, well, you died. Let's forget about this guy now. Definitely very much still in it. And there's a whole bunch of content. What you can do, very cool. I love the amount of customizability of the characters, because not even just the amount of effort that they got for their unique equipment for each character, but as you level up, you get, at certain levels, AP. You can change these APs in for special abilities, depending on what keywords your character has. They have some generic ones. What does AP stand for? So AP is an ability point. Some of them are amazing. One that I've saved up for my character is summoning some Cthulhu tentacles to come in and attack my enemies. It's going to be so great. I love Richard's character. His character is kind of like this <laughs> madman. If he kills somebody, he has a ability that he can use. He pulls a Wookiee, rips off the arm, and beats the other character with that arm. <laughs> yeah. He was able to use some of his ability points to purchase it, where he has another attack where he bites them. Whenever he goes to the inn, he has to roll a die. And if he gets to a certain success or failure rate, he starts to roll just because that's his character. I love the stuff that they did with this. <laughs> The little touches like that are great. The inn is one of his unique places. It's the same kind of thing as the gypsy encampment is for me. You roll a die, there are a range of outcomes, and the one outcome there is he starts a brawl. And I think in that case, we do a skirmish with an angry mob or whatever yep. it is. Yep, that's correct. It's just cool. There's a lot of stuff. He's Venging Madman. That's what his character's named. Eventually, you're, we'll get to the point where you have an encounter. And there are a lot of different map tiles. There are map tiles that place on the board. It's a grid. It'll give you a start location. It'll have where you're going to put the monsters. You'll have little magnifying glasses that search locations that you can go and possibly find treasure or items. And then it's like a dungeon crawler at that point. If you defeat all the monsters and there's more map tiles to explore in that particular scenario, then it's adventuring mode. You're not fighting anything, but you can then start exploring things. Move on to the next map. As soon as you change maps, whether you're entering an encounter or you change maps during an encounter, leadership changes. So in an encounter, the leader stays the leader until you change maps. And then it'll switch again. That's probably my favorite part of it, but I love dungeon crawlers. Same here. One other thing that we probably ought to mention is it's a campaign game, but there's different sections. It's kind of broken into different sections. So you've got a story that we're working on, and the story is divided up into chapters. Some abilities last for an entire chapter. Some of them last for a story. So there's a lot of different things to take into account. During... Some are a one-time use for that story. Totally. So you use it and it's a one-time thing and you can't use it again until the next story. On that note, your character has a bunch of different attributes. Vita, which is your life, and you have defense we talked a little bit about, and might, bonus to damage, and then you have power points. So your power points, somewhat of a resource that you really need to manage. All of your special abilities, for example, will require the use of power points. For example, one of my telekinetic powers is to push somebody. It normally costs two power points. I have six to begin with, and it costs two to use. You can see you really got to manage those. I have another thing that makes it so that it only half, so it costs one to push somebody instead of two. But they don't replenish on their own, and they don't replenish very often. It's something that you really have to guard when you're going to use them, and use them strategically. Ranged weapons have ammo, have a certain number of uses because of the ammo. One thing that I think most of these type of games now include is your weapons are one-handed or two-handed, and you can only use two hands worth of weapons. You do a good job with that. I like that they've added the touch of, you know what, this only has three shots and it's gone. Yeah, you can wield two weapons, but if you want to actually perform an attack with that second weapon, you're spending a power point to do that. Right. And like you said... Power points are hard to come by. Now, there are advanced rules that you, there's different ways to get power points back, which I think maybe we ought to do in our game. But I think they've really done a good job as far as there is a little bit of resource management in that as far as combat goes. It's not even just resource management for power points, but it's resource management just for health points, too. What I've noticed with this game, even just being damaged in general, it is so hard to get your health back. 
It's not like I could just turn around and go to town, rest at the inn, or go to the doctor, or whatever. And, oh, I'm full health. I have to spend money, a decent amount of money, mm -hmm. to get health. The last time we played, I was severely injured. We went to town, and I had to spend all of my money and still didn't get up to max health. It's definitely a little bit brutal as far as that goes. But I think, once again, the fact that you can still play as a ghost eases up that brutality just a little bit. The other thing I think that I really have liked about this game is how often your skills come into play. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of skills in this game. Each character does not have bonuses in all the skills. When you have to do a skill check, more often than not, you don't have a bonus in that skill check. So it's just whatever you roll, you're going to get. But if you do have a skill check, it can be super helpful because you're just rolling a d10. Even a plus two bonus or a plus one bonus on a skill can be huge. If you get a six, well, now your odds are 50% instead of 40% to pass that skill check. I like how different each character is very different. There's a large variety of characters. In this game, maybe more than other games, the variety of the skills that the players have factors in more so the diversity in the characters and the weaknesses that they have. A lot of games, it's a simple scale, maybe 1 to 10, where the scale is much larger. That factors in a whole lot different than it does in some other games, which I think is great. The only complaint that I would make about that as far as characters go, I love the variety and choice. I love the depth that they went to creating the characters and the differences and all of that is just that there's not a whole lot of character creation on our part. I don't get to really decide a lot on how my character will develop. There is some on the lore tree. There is some, but not as much as there is in a lot of other games. And that's one of the things that I really love about these types of games. I would agree with that. You basically get to pick your focus as a character, and you have two options. For example, the Magus, you can be the Order of the Alchemist, or you can be the Stargazer. Each of those paths will give you specific powers or abilities based on what you choose. The other one that you don't choose, you're never going to see those or gain those abilities. Mm -hmm. You're right, there's definitely more character customization at the beginning in other campaign-style games than this. That is definitely true. I almost wish that you could choose at different stages what direction you wanted to go. You still can to a point, when you go up a level, you still have two choices. For example, when you gain 100 lore, basically level up. Two choices of abilities that you want to take. Whatever one you take, the other one's not going to be available to you again. And you get up to 200 lore... Once again, you make a choice. Which ability do I want? You don't have to take the ability in the same column that you took the right. previous one in. You can take the other one. Once you take that ability, let's say you take the, the ability in the right column, then the ability in the left-hand column, once again, is not available to you for the rest of the game. Comparing this maybe to Dungeons & Dragons, for example, I don't think skills get utilized as often as they probably should in D&D, especially campaigns that are far more combat-oriented. Right. Whereas in this game, we are rolling skill checks all the time, whether we're on the world map, whether we're in town, the encounters, you're always, always using your skills, whether right. you're trying to avoid a condition that a monster's trying to put on you, or you're trying to negotiate with the townsfolk, you're doing a skirmish, or you're always rolling skill checks. That comes into play a lot, and you mentioned one of the times it does is when a monster hits you with a certain attack, you're trying to avoid a certain condition being put on you. To roll whatever skill check it tells you to roll there, you roll that d10, add a bonus if you have it, and hope that you get the thing to survive it. There are conditions, there's 12 positive conditions and 12 negative conditions. There's little cardboard cutouts for each one of those conditions. They have different effects. It may be a condition that says... Road events, for example, will just be a simple... This is what happened. It tells a little story about what happened. You make a decision, and then you roll a skill check. If you make the right choice and pass your skill check, you get one of your positive conditions. Like you mentioned, they come into play a lot, and they have actual consequences as well. I like that the negative effects are actually not very much fun at all. It's not just a mild inconvenience with a lot of them, mm -hmm. but you have the opportunity to try to get rid of them quite a bit. Yeah. Even if you don't have the skill, you could still roll a die at the end of every single round to get rid of these effects. It's just, if you have the skill, it's much easier. One of them is spooked. At the end of every single turn, you're going to roll your nerve check to see if you become unspooked. I like that because it gives you a lot of opportunity. Even if you are spooked, you get the negative consequences. You have plenty of chances because the odds, eventually you're going to be able to get rid of it. And one thing I've also noticed is the positive conditions that happen are rare, but they typically last the entire story. 
for example, if you do something in town and you become respected, you're respected through the rest of the story. You're gaining that benefit for the rest of the story, which is amazing. We talked about skirmishes. We talked about encounters. One of the things that typically towards the end of a story, you're during one of the encounters, you're going to come up against an affliction, which is like a boss. So you have different levels of difficulty in this. If you encounter an affliction, that's typically going to be your big fight at the end of the story. One other thing that is interesting, which is difficult time as we've had playing this game, staying alive and everything else, is that there are four levels of difficulty for this game. So wow. there's Dusk, Twilight, Midnight, and Nightmare. And we've just been playing Dusk. I can't even imagine playing this on Nightmare. Oh, no. Not even. You would bring that up, and I'm going to bring up something that happened months ago. I've been playing Isle of Cats solo, and I've been playing it at the very basic version. Use three solo lessons that Little Sister's going to play with. I still haven't won playing it solo. That's just the basic level, and you can put in these advanced. I like it when a game has a challenge. There was another game that we were playing that we were at the basic level and it was just defeating us. Yeah, I think there's several. City of Kings is that way. City of Kings is probably what I'm thinking about. It just gives you incentive to play the game and get better. Yeah. And wiser, maybe. Wiser in your actions. Wiser in your decisions. That wiser isn't always more cautious. Maybe sometimes that incentivizes you to be more aggressive in certain parts. One thing that made us really gun-shy was the first time that we played, we went to go pursue this rumor. And it was way, way overclassed from what we were. It, it was horrible. It took us a little while to, I guess, we'll go investigate another rumor. And most of the other rumors were just fine. We were plenty strong enough. But it was just the first one we had no hope of winning. And it kind of worried us. But these rumors, they're such a great way to level up, to get new experience, to get new equipment. That is one thing that I love about this game so much more than games like Gloomhaven, you can share things. So like my character gets bonuses to finding items and being able to draw and pick which items are better. Instead of just looking what's good for me, I could be like, wow, this one's okay for me, but this one's really good for Andy. I'm going to keep this card and I just give it to Andy. So then Andy's better. We've talked about rumors a couple of times now. We've talked about several of the different things in town. So whenever you get to one of these three towns that Andy talked about, you can get town services. Depending on the size of the town is how many town services you can get. One of the towns has three services you can do. One of them has two. I believe the other one just has one. Those services, that's where you decide, okay, I'm going to go to the inn and gamble, or I'm going to go to the physician and heal, or I'm going to go to the tavern and get a rumor. Rumors are just one of these things that you can do when you're in a town. Essentially, you're going and you're listening in on the rumors that people are talking about. Draw this card. It tells you what the rumor is that you just heard about. You decide if you're going to go investigate it. Like Logan said, they're great ways to advance, to get gold or whatever it is. Great stuff. The rumors are some of my favorites because typically when you have a rumor, you're going to have an encounter. You're going to actually have your minis out. You're going to be doing a battle instead of a skirmish. I love doing the rumors. Not only that, the rewards have been amazing with the rumors. When you gain items, some of the items that you get are actually ingredients. So there's some item crafting that you can do. Get all the ingredients for something, you can actually craft an item and then use that item in the party, which I thought was really cool. There's a ton of that. That's one of the things that's awesome, right? Some of the items that we find are recipes for whatever. And it tells you the ingredients that you need. We haven't made anything yet, but I'm just excited to make something. I don't even care what it does or what it is, right? I'm, as Logan's talking about with his ability to look at extra item cards and decide what to keep, that's one of the things that we're keeping in mind that whole time is, oh, you know what? That's one of the things that we need for this recipe. It's just cool. It's just something that I think is going to be really cool for us to do. Like I said, we haven't done it yet. We haven't actually been able to make anything yet. I think we just barely started story number two. So. I'm looking forward to getting more items. Like you said, Logan's ability definitely is going to help out getting the right ingredients and picking the correct items for our group. That's been super helpful. I got the Kickstarter version. With the version that I got, it came with the Creature Crate, and the minis are just amazing. Very impressed with the minis that came with this. And still, I just love the fact that you have your miniature for your character, and I love the fact that there's a separate miniature when you become a ghost, so clear blue plastic for your ghost character. Very nice touch. One thing that I think is a really nice touch, too, is their app. They yeah. actually put a ton of effort in app on your phone, keep track of your character and everything, to the point where it even has drop down when you go onto your equipment. Oh, I got this equipment to use my head slot for my armor slot. That modifies your stats inside it. 
and you'll have to check this, but it is on Google Play. I don't know about the Apple Store. No, it was not on iOS when I last checked, and I just checked again, and it's still not on iOS. Google phone or an Android phone. I like being able to keep track of those things on my phone. I don't have to erase. I don't have to take detailed notes on some piece of paper and then like, oh, what did I write later on? Because I don't have good handwriting. I just like it when you take damage and heal. The sound effects that come yeah. with it. <laughs> it. It's so dramatic. It's so funny because you, you lose one hit point. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so loud. And then you... <laughs> with the expansions... There are four different storybooks, quite a few stories in each of the books. So there's a lot of content, especially if you get the expansions. There's a lot of these stories to go through. I don't even know how long it will take us to get through everything. It's going to take a decent amount of time to get through all this content. There's just so much. How many expansions came with the Kickstarter? It came with two expansions. Folklore, The Affliction, which is the base game. The storybook one is in base game. There's storybook two, which is Dark Tales. Storybook three, which is Nightmare Tales. And storybook four, which is Fall of the Spire. So I don't know if this comes with the expansions or the base game, but there's also an adventure creation kit. Four storybooks is not enough for you. There's an adventure creation kit so that you can create your own. What I like so far about the story, there's been lasting consequences throughout it. So it's almost legacy in that way. That campaign. A campaign, but it's stuff like Andy's character with a certain circumstance. And it just keeps coming back up. For something that it's not a legacy game, but just a campaign, it's interesting how those things keep working its way back in. Nathan, it, you've only played this game two times. Still didn't come up against any undead. Uh, the whole time I was looking for an undead. Took us off the road the one time in hopes that we'd get an undead. The next time you played that I wasn't able to make it, you had like undead all over the place. Yeah, those were when the vampires really destroyed us. Yeah, those vampires were rough. We could have used the Slayer at that time, Nathan. Yeah. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy this game. All the points that we've talked about, or that you've talked about, you guys have far more experience with the game than I do. The game is great. I look forward to playing it again. I look forward to experiencing it multiple times. I don't know if we're going to get through all that content. We need to. It may take a few years. We have several campaigns going and several campaign games on the way. Yeah. So, yeah. It's be tough. so much campaign stuff. If you like campaign games, I would very much recommend if you can find the Kickstarter version. The amount of content you get with the Kickstarter version is insane. Dave, what are your final thoughts? A while back, we did a top five episode. This is one of the games that I thought, this one individually could see this becoming one of my favorite games. I just haven't played it enough yet. For me, it's a winner, absolutely. It's a game that I could see getting up there and being one of my top five games. But I couldn't commit to that because I hadn't played it enough yet. Fair so enough. that meant it was your number one, right? <laughs> and other games together, yes. Still have issues with your number one. <laughs> yeah. Logan, what about you? What are your final thoughts? I love this game. For me personally, it fixed some of the issues that I have with Gloomhaven, which I still love Gloomhaven. It's actually on my top five. I like this game. I like the variety of it. I love the horror motif. It's an automatic win for me anyway. I am so excited about this game. I'm excited for us to get into chapter two when we unlock even more characters to choose from. Because I'm already so excited about my character right now. And I'm so excited to do more things in this game. I have one complaint about this game. And it's a very small complaint. The rules aren't the easiest to understand at times. I think it's just the English translation of it. Clunky first session or two trying to get through it and learn the game. But once you get the game down, it's smooth. That would be my only complaint. Otherwise, solid game. We have had so much fun playing this game. If you're going to say that, my only complaint is there's only seven days in the week. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Right. This is Folklore the Affliction. The designer is Nick Blaine, Will Donovan, and the publisher is Greenbrier Games and Twin Fire Productions. Plays 90 to 120 minutes. The weight of it, they listed it at 3.67, which is on the heavier side, and it definitely is on the heavier side. I actually think that a little too generous. I think you think it, it should be heavier? Especially the first few times. Because yeah. there's so much information in the rule book that I would say it's more towards four-ish. But after you play it a few times, it's not that difficult. But it's just getting over that hump. With a lot of games, learning the iconography, mm -hmm. learning the basics. Yeah, I think it's just the amount of content. And just the fact that the skirmishes, the encounters, and everything plays a little differently. 
So there's just a lot to understand and a lot to learn several different ways that you're playing. I would agree with Logan. I think it would be more along the lines of a four in complexity, but probably not one I would play with my kids. A little too much for them. It's a gamer's game, for sure. Absolutely. Extremely fun game. Check it out. Folklore of the Affliction. Until next time. We'll see you battling through, and hopefully you find some of those undead, because I need some of those. <laughs>